Welcome to B2B Uncut. Uh, I, I'm going to give a second people to join. We've got some, some uh, live joiners here. We're recording this for folks that uh, want to listen to it later. I'm Jari Carter. I'm the host of B2B Uncut. Uh, we're here in the final episode of 2022. Uh, and today's not just another episode that we've had some really cool and exciting guests this year. Uh, we have two, three actually big things for you. One, we're going to wrap up the 2022 season. Uh, two, we're celebrating Oro's 10th anniversary. I have a couple of really exciting guests here for the 10th anniversary. Congratulations. I'm excited to talk about this. And three, we have a surprise guest for you who's going to join us a little bit later. Surprise guest. But I want to talk to these two very important, uh, very interesting guests, two people that on this podcast need no introduction, though we're going to let them give a little bit of an introduction. Yoav Kutner, who is the CEO and co-founder of Oro, and Dima Soroka, who's the CTO and co-founder of uh, Oro. Gentlemen, welcome to the podcast today. It's really an honor to have you both. Thank you for joining. Thank you, Jari. Good to Thank be back. Thank you. <laughs> I know the three amigos back at it again. All right, so I oh, yeah. would love, <laughs> I would love uh, to have uh, you two just briefly introduce yourselves. Um, a lot of people in the Oro ecosystem they hear your names. Um, a lot of people may be new to the Oro ecosystem and they may not know your background. So, would love to just allow you two uh, to introduce yourself. Uh, a little bit about your experience in e-commerce, your experience in B2B e-commerce, and and uh, how you got to Oro. Uh, Yoav, let's start with you, and then we'll head over to Dima. So I got into the e-commerce world in 2004, a company called, uh, back then, uh, Varian. Uh, we then created a product um, that we we thought we are going to use for ourselves and our customers called Magento. Um, and that kind of took off for some reason. I don't know yet why, but we're trying to figure it out. Um, and uh, you, you have the, a team trying to trying to figure out how Magento. Was why, successful. How did Magento was successful? Yeah, how come that happened? Um, a lot of people then, are willing uh, to help you. <laughs> uh, and then we actually, um, uh, yeah. So that product took off. I was a co-founder and CTO there. Was leading the product and technologies. Um, and after we sold that to eBay. Um, I left in 2012. Um, uh, I was bored. <laughs> I didn't need to work, but uh, I loved what I was doing. Uh, so um, when a few of us uh, here on the call uh, decided uh, to, uh, to work together again, which was what we loved and build products, um, we started Oro. And um, what we learned uh, at Magento was that, you know, uh, the B2B uh, kind of space, the B2B industry is kind of underserved when it comes to digital commerce. And that's what we kind of set our sights for and uh, what we're passionate about for the last uh, 10 years now. So, Yeah, absolutely. Great. Thank you. I can't believe it's been 10 years. It really just thinking about that. October 2012 uh, was, was when we got going. Dima, uh, I'd love to have you introduce yourself to the team. I'm Dima Soroka. Um, my e-commerce journey started uh, in 2006, so I'm a little bit younger than you are. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> yes, <laughs> and uh, it also started uh, in a company called Varian. Uh, I was working with you at that time and was part of uh, Magento journey. And uh, in 2012, was happy to start uh, Oro. Uh, which we've been a uh, very nice <laughs> journey for the last 10 years. And uh, yeah, so I love technology. I love to new challenges. I love working with customers. Uh, I love working with my team. And uh, that's about me. <laughs> that's great. Thank you so much, Dima. I want to, and that's, I, I do want to say that's the most I've ever heard Dima talk about himself. <laughs> <laughs> I know it's very hard, it's very hard to get Dima to talk, talk much about himself. I do. Um, I, the way we're going to structure this call is um, we're going to, we're going to talk about the business elements of, of Oro and, and the early days and the starting and we'll look forward into the future because I think uh, Yoav and Dima have such a rich perspective in that. And then um I think we're going to talk about uh, some of the fun things uh, towards the end of the call. Some of the early stories, uh, you know, some of the interesting things that may be 
a little bit uh, uh, lesser known to, to folks within the ecosystem. So let's go back though to 2012 from a business perspective. What was the what was the digital e-commerce and specifically the B2B digital commerce landscape like back then, uh, Dima and Yoav? What, what, do you, what do you remember? Yeah, so I'll take a first uh, stab at this. Um, so when we left uh, Magento, we really felt like uh, the B2C uh, space, the business to consumer or direct to consumer space was uh, very kind of saturated already with uh, so many platforms in the game. Um, but what we we noticed at that time was that more and more companies that were actually not necessarily focused on selling direct uh, to consumer uh, started coming on- online or trying to go online. Let me say that uh, with some kind of digital commerce. Um, and um, as as we ran a B two C platform, we really thought, you know, what's the big difference, right? We can just do it, and everything's okay. And and we saw this across the board. All the platforms were kind of like, yeah, it's the same thing. There's a shopping cart, you have to cart checkout, no problem. Um, we there were other players on the market at that time. They were more kind of specific for industry, specific industries, specific needs for specific verticals. Uh, that were serving specific B2B needs, but they were, again, very kind of archaic. Um, they were kind of uh, old technologies that were not really extendable. Uh, they weren't necessarily flexible and didn't really answer kind of the way uh, the user experience that was demanded by some of the buyers was actually evolving. So it was very stagnant in terms of what was offered to B2B unless you were in a specific vertical that had a specific tool. Um, trying to use any kind of uh, other platforms that were built for B2C was very, very hard. Uh, and that's where we kind of put ourselves into. That's where the kind of the gap that we try to fill in that time. Yeah, great. Thank you. Uh, Dima, any any additional perspective you would add there? Yeah, I think um, one important aspect of B2B uh, at that time and now is um, B2B is where a sales team of your organization working with other organizations and uh, mm-hmm. sales teams need uh, proper tools to do their job, right? And uh, taking this into account, uh, that was one of the driving factor uh, why we started our journey with uh, CRM product, right? Because uh, that's where sales team sits, and that's from where uh, online conversation with the customer starts. So I think it was at that time, and it's still relevant uh, nowadays, and it will be relevant for for seeing future. Yeah, it's it's such an interesting point that you make because we we did start with a CRM product because there was such little connection in traditional B two C technologies and the actual sales experience, the customer experience, this multiple touches in a sales experience. Yoav, I'd love for you to weigh in on that, like that sort of single dimensional, and you were part of the problem, right? You, you've talked about this before, like in creating this like amazing B2C platform that at the time had a ridiculous amount of market share, but almost no B2B capabilities or really thought process to it. So t- t- talk about that a little bit, Yoav, if, if you wouldn't mind just kind of weighing in on that. Yeah, sure. And again, just reminding everybody, this is uh, about 15 years ago, so much younger, much bigger, <laughs> much bigger uh, ego. Uh, you know, so uh, with Magento, we really thought we created the end all of all e-commerce uh, platforms, right? Meaning that we thought that we can achieve anything with it. Uh, we were not as uh, kind of uh, educated about what the needs and differences are for the B2B space. So we really kind of thought, you know, what's again, like I mentioned before, it's there's a shopping cart and an add the cart button, what else is needed, right? Um, but really, we were doing a disservice to many of our uh, potential uh, customers because they really didn't uh, get the feature set that was that needed to be created in the underlying uh, uh, technology to actually do this and support their actual needs. So just one example for is a pricing engine, right? We were coming from a platform that was like, all about like the same price for everybody. We treat everybody the same. Uh, just has to be as intuitive as possible to check out for the highest average order, the amount that we can get, and that's it. Uh, where we started working with B two B companies, we started learning that there's a deep relationship between the customers and the, I mean, the buyers and the sellers in this case, um, and really have to focus about the specific user experience that they need in order to actually be successful using this platform. So our first attempts mm-hmm. were very kind of 
very basic in terms of what we were offering and nobody was actually using it. So when we started building some B2B implementations on Magento, uh, we were like, okay, um, use it as is. It's basically B2C, but you you can use it for B2B. And, and we saw that there was no use uh, of the platforms that we were building. Um, other cases we started investing, our customers were really wanting to invest and get there. And then we caused them to build like 80% of the code that they needed on top of uh, Magento. So they basically ended up with a very custom solution in the end. Um, and then they had to support it, et cetera. So the costs were really, really high for them. Um, like I said, that's that's what we kind of had to change. Our mindset had to change. We had to kind of learn what's the real differences. Um, how, again, coming to pricing, we get millions of price points uh, or almost, almost infinite price points uh, for different customers um, and now in the system. Uh, the user experience has to be tailored to the to the customer and the user within that customer that actually uh, is using the system at that point. So we really have to kind of shift our mindset uh, completely relearn uh, what we call uh, B2B commerce or B2B digital commerce and really build a product for that. And again, I, I would say that we, we don't usually just jump in to build products. We really looked at the landscape that existed, uh, looked at the roadmaps uh, of other platforms. We were big advocates of the, the existing uh, e-commerce platforms to actually do this. B2B, you can, you can look back in the, you know, 10 years ago, we were talking about it. When we just had the CRM on the market, we knew that we want to uh, integrate into an e-commerce platform. And we were advocating for those platforms to uh, address the B2B need. Um, none of them picked up the ball at the time. And that's what caused us five years later to actually start working on our B2B um, and basically enhance our CRM product to support the front end part of it as well. Yeah, it's... Really interesting. I'd love to. I'd, I'd love to fast forward to today um, because Aura has been right about a lot of things uh, from a products technology perspective and the way the market's going. What are some things that you think that that folks should be? You know, how do, how do you envision the market going in the next three to five years? What sh what should people be thinking about? Um, uh, you know, like, just give us a perspective on, on the next few years, um, Jens. You may want to take a first step. Yeah, I think uh, next few years will be, uh, <laughs> uh, from technology perspective, uh, we see uh, different trends, right? So we're hearing about uh, composable commerce, uh, headless getting traction, Right. Uh, of course, um, everybody looking only in cloud-based solutions at this point. I think these trends uh, will continue growing and uh, again, we are definitely part of it. Uh, so for next three years, uh, three to five years, uh, uh, we will add more capabilities to our product to support these trends. Uh, and uh, no, it's uh, uh, customer needs are still the same, right? So yeah. uh, more, more and more companies uh, like looking how to optimize their sales cycle uh, because uh, even like this current economy situation, right? So this uh, uh, recession, inflation, and uh, Companies are about optimizing their sales cycle, and to do so, they need tools. And uh, in B two B commerce, uh, tools are not only about uh, facilitate your uh, online sales uh, to end users. It's also about uh, optimizing uh, uh, internal processes. Uh, so I think that's where it's going for uh, next few years. <laughs> What I, I appreciate you talking, bringing up these these phrases like composable commerce and headless and things like this. What and I, this may be a question for both of you. What I, Oro gets very highly rated by the analysts, Gartner, Forrester. Uh, I, I definitely know Gartner and other analysts uh, ha have you um, very much on their radar as as um, you know a a up and coming. And really, not only an up and coming and established technology. What? Um, how much of this is hype versus reality? You know, like how much of the idea of composable commerce 
the idea of headless, how much of that is is sort of analyst buzzwords versus like what's really getting traction with with customers? Because one of the things that I see is um, B two B companies. Are are in in a lot of ways are really trying to or working to figure out like the the basics of like how to really get their motion online or how to be uh, omni channel or multi channel businesses and and I'm curious how these sort of industry buzzwords fit into what you're seeing with real companies and what they're doing. Maybe you have you can you can take that one. Yeah, so I think like when we started ten years ago, um, you know, we came from the B two C world, like we've already mentioned, and it was really cutting edge, right? We were, you know, everybody was trying to launch a unique uh, e-commerce experience for B2C. Everybody was uh, coming up with uh, different features, different uh, user experiences. There were so many technologies that were focused um, uh, around the B2C user experience um, and for the store managers or whatnot. But um, we, we honestly expected 10 years ago when we started the journey that the B2B world will catch up because when we started, we found out that the B2B world is maybe, and I'm being nice here, five to 10 years behind the curve on technology of uh, that the B2C world was at. And that was yeah. kind of something that we were really uh, surprised at the time. Uh, and I was hoping in these 10 years that they'll catch up. I think we are still playing a lot of catch up uh, on the B2B side right now. Um, you know, we, if we if we look at the analyst, and again, with all respect to the analyst, I think we are as technologists, as analysts, we we're living in a different bubble than the the B two B kind of decision makers uh, when it mm. comes to technology. We throw we throw at them buzzwords and technologies and headless and composable. And again, I'm not saying we shouldn't support them for the real use cases, but a lot of times we come in and it's much more basic, right? And, and again, mm -hmm. I like to tell the story because this happened more than once where we found actually customers that the executive team doesn't use email even, right? They basically right. get the, you know, their, their emails kind of uh, printed out on paper, they write their answers uh, in hand, and then somebody types it back in to reply to the email. So again, we, we have to kind of adjust to the, to the world we kind of serving. And uh, talking to them about AI, composable, stuff like that, when they don't even have a website up and running, that's kind of, a, right. you know, we have to play catch up. So I think, again, we were we were a little bit uh, underwhelmed uh, by how fast this industry is moving compared to others in the world, meaning that they're, they're really, really still behind. They're still trying to figure it out, even though it took already, I think, we'll, we'll say five years that we are really into the B2B or digital kind of uh, commerce uh, space for B2B companies. And I thought it will move faster. I'll be honest. My, my expectation were that this is going to catch on and like fire and start jumping like it happened with uh, B2C. It's, it's mm -hmm. not the case yet. I think we're still uh, early on. And, it, and again, it's, it shouldn't be surprising to anybody that knows kind of the B2B space. I mean, these are more kind of established companies. They usually uh, move much slower. Their production, uh, you know, cycles are longer. They, they have products that run sometimes for the same product for 50 years and they don't change anything, right? So when it comes to mm -hmm. their kind of mentality, kind of culture, I think technology sometimes is too fast paced uh, for them to kind of catch up. And that's where we have to put a kind of our uh, consultant uh, glasses on or hats or whatever and, yeah. and say, okay, this is what is important for you. This is how we kind of uh, get you up to speed. The good news is once we see and do the first kind of baby steps, we see that the, there's a demand for it and there's hunger within these organizations as they hire more technology people, uh, when they start getting feedback from customers or demands from customers, right? That start seeing features or experiences that they're getting at other uh, companies they kind of buy from, this starts uh, accelerating, right? And we see that um, even though initially it's kind of uh, very slow uh, adoption within the company, once the ball starts rolling, it starts rolling very fast and we start seeing a lot of demand. So it's it's sometimes even surprising to us that a company that we were talking about digital had no idea what we're talking about. And then they, you know, on our whatever quarter, quarterly or uh, by yearly meetings we have with them, they start talking to us about AI and headless and composable. So they're catching on. That's the good news. Mm -hmm. I think, again, it's, a, it's such a vast market that we really have to um, start addressing these things. And I really feel like it's starting to accelerate. Again, in a, like I say, in the B2B kind of uh, pace, but it's starting to accelerate. Uh, we are starting to see RFPs that are much more sophisticated in the B2B than we used to get. Um, and I think this is something that is just going to start catching on and on. 
And again, I'm just saying it once more to, to round this up, but as companies that are serving this industry, we should be a bit more humble, not push necessarily on the fastest and the best technology that's right there, that's here today and gone tomorrow, and really invest in them for the long term. Um, and, and like I said, B2B companies think in five-year terms, 10-year terms. They don't think in yeah. six months or months like we used to be in the B2C world. And you yeah. mentioned a very important point. Yeah, I think, again, like on uh, technology trends, you always should put customer in context. Like and in B2B world, unfortunately, uh, there are not a lot technically mature companies, right? So mm -hmm. uh, again, going from uh, printing emails uh, and... Uh, so again, most of the companies already have uh, ERPs and other solution in place, but they usually uh, have very minimal technical teams. And uh, to support these companies, we should come to the market with uh, easygoing solution that uh, can be easily enabled uh, and uh, uh, implemented for the customer. Yeah, I hear you talking about like approachability, really, like approachability of the technology, and especially companies coming from a basic maybe brochure website that was built, you know, 10, 15 years ago that hasn't really been touched, then to a full digital transformation. And I actually think that's not an overused buzzword in the B2B commerce world, because you're seeing a lot of it, like you're talking about, Yoav, you're seeing these companies go from, you know, these brochure websites that were built maybe 15 years ago into this full digital transformation. And, and, um, it's first of all, what does that feel like? What does that feel like to help a company, you know, put like another engine on the plane of their growth and really watch that just completely transform the company? What what's what's that feeling like for you too? So for me, and uh, I'm I'm probably gonna kill uh, your your reference for me as the rock and roll CEO. This is what <laughs> I love. <laughs> yeah, nothing could kill I, the I, rock and roll CEO uh, reference. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I'm. I'm. Ex I love it. I love seeing a business kind of transform in a digital way. And I'm, I know this sounds corny, and uh, and but this is really it's such a difference to come to a company where everything is manual, and it's like you know, some um, person that's been there for like 30, 35 years has everything in his head. And when we start kind of asking questions, they always say, oh, let's call Bill or Jane and they will come here and give us the answer. And then actually formalizing it in a way that actually is automated, it works, saves a lot of time, reduces errors for the business. And then I, I love it that after six months, 12 months, 18 months, when we kind of touch base with the customers, we see how they start adopt, uh, adapting into the new world and adopting the actual technology to make them more uh, efficient, more successful, more modern. And that's, it's, it's something I, I know, again, it's, it sounds like it's not real, but I, every time I see that, I just like lean back in my chair and I'm like, wow, that's one more company we actually helped. And that's something we, we actually changed. And, and we'll, we'll know that this company is gonna stay around now longer because you know the, the tens or hundreds or thousands of people that are working there uh, have a future with this company. And this company is gonna stay around and, and in some B2B cases, we, we talk to companies that's been around for over 100 years, sometimes even more than, you know, and a lot of them are kind of family kind of uh, started business in, you know, late 1800s or whatnot that are still going on today and kind of working with their next generation and actually making them more modern and more applicable to what's going on in today's uh, demanding world of technology. It's something that I really love. I, I love this feeling of coming to this very manual company and start automating and see how people's faces change when they when they see that their workload is is lighter and when they're more efficient and there's less errors and less frustration and it's still sometimes a cultural war within the company and we try to kind of um, you know walk a fine line between the the old school of the company and the uh, and the future of the company so we're in a very kind of interesting place i think at the kind of life uh, line of these uh, or life um, uh, schedule of these companies where we are really seeing something that's going to really revolutionize how they're doing business, right? And that's something that, again, I love. I, I love being part of what technology can do for uh, for companies and people. I, I've been doing it for many, many years now. And that's actually what drives me. So it doesn't, 
you know, when I wake up in the morning and choose if it's B2B or B2C, or I used to do uh, economic software or whatnot, it doesn't matter when we come and kind of help people and when we come and make their lives easier and actually make them more successful. That's really what I love to, to see in the end. And like I said, that's my, my passion in the end. Uh, I love that. Thanks for sharing that, Yoav. I, I mean, I, I've been in probably hundreds of meetings with the, the two of you as we've talked to companies about, uh, about this. And, it, and the conversation is never about shrinking. It's never about staff reduction. It's always about growth. It's how do we, how do we take a company and give them a better competitive competitive advantage and giving them give them a higher growth. And and it's, it's really cool to see you underscore that. I have one more question for the both of you. And that is um, you know, speaking about what you love to do, which is helping B2B companies really sort of prepare for the future. What advice would you give if you had one piece of advice to give to a B2B company, a B2B leader? Um in the, who's who's grappling with this, you know, sort of what to do in the e-commerce, what to do in the digital commerce world. What what piece of advice would you would you give them, Dima? I'll start with you, and then and then we'll end with you, Yoav. Uh, sure, this is very interesting question, and I think uh, again, big observation uh, and conclusion at this point that we can make is like okay, so B two B world is much slower than B two C, right? So it's uh, I think again it's coming from a nature of the companies because uh, business already functional, right? So people already selling, selling on different channels and they're looking into online for us additional channel. Uh, and um, unfortunately, decision-making process is slower. And uh, unfortunately, they uh, like even like going live and exploring new opportunities is a bit slower process. So probably advice that I would give is like to be more opportunistic in this uh, case and uh, accelerate digital transformation, accelerate online presence. So that is important. And again, like based on customers uh, that we're working with, we see one day going online. So that's a game changer for them. Mm. Yeah. Thanks for that. you all. Yeah, I think uh, I'll kind of echo what Dima says. I think um, for the short-term companies that didn't figure it out, have to start figuring it out, meaning that it's time now to at least take the first steps uh, into digital. Uh, this world is moving fast. We're seeing how industries are changing within the B2B already, right? Um, marketplaces are coming on board that are kind of uh, taking away uh, other distributors, uh, you know, Amazon is fighting a lot of B2B industries right now, right? So uh, if companies are not going to adjust to kind of being a bit more, and I say a bit more, it doesn't have to be in weeks, but it has to be a little bit more uh, fast uh, moving on decision making. Um, and one thing that we kind of, you know, as a, as a kind of a suggestion is, um, and we see this a lot, is that a lot of these companies um, in the B2B space are afraid to take a decision and, and, and what impact it will have on the business. One thing we kind of learned with these companies is that trying doesn't necessarily change much, right? And we, we're really good at working with these companies about telling them, okay, we're not going to move all your business overnight to digital, right? Let's take a phased approach. Let's solve the biggest uh, problems that you have. Let's uh, treat the lowest hanging fruit that we can actually do uh, quickly for you and kind of see the success of that. Let's start by moving maybe 10% of your sophisticated customers to this platform before we kind of move everybody on. So a lot of times there's this fear that we're going to come, us or technology, it doesn't matter, and, and just change the whole business overnight to something new. And they're not really uh, sure how that's going to take with their customers, et cetera. And what we actually introduced to them is like, look, it's going to be a phased approach. We're not going to change everything overnight. We can take a year, two, three years even. And we see customers that are doing it where they're shifting small chunks of their customers, you know, month by month or quarter by quarter to the digital platform, keeping their uh, other customers uh, working as is and figuring it out, right? Fine tuning it, et cetera. So again, I think this concept is a bit foreign to a lot of companies and manufacturers that we work with where if they build an assembly line, it's a you know two-year investment in building the line, and then uh, until the, they get some feedback on the whatever they manufactured. Here we're talking about like much faster kind of uh, feedback and much faster uh, uh, 
changes to what we need to actually fine tune for them to be successful. So my first and you know most important uh, recommendation is to start. That's the thing. Start, select something, even if it's the wrong technology, even if it's the wrong path, learn quickly and then change based on what you learned rather than sitting and trying to figure it out for five years. By that time, mm-hmm. five years is a lifetime in our, in our industry and technology. I, I hear you reducing the risk of failure um, or at least reducing the cost of failure as a learning experience to grow and, and sort of fail forward into, um, into you know, something that works for the business. Um, fascinating. Well, uh, thank you too so much um, for this. I, we're going to hang on. We, we've got um, our surprise guest already here. Uh, and so we're going we're gonna to welcome Daphna Andrews uh, to, to our call today. Hi, Daphna. Welcome. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Glad to be here. And Daphna is, this is some news for folks. Daphna is actually taking over as the host of B2B Uncut as we go into 2023. So she's going to be taking over the podcast uh, in in 2023. Daphna, you're new to the the Oro team. Uh, So would love to have you. This podcast has really grown uh, throughout throughout 2022. We've seen um, just this awesome transformation. Uh, we have, uh, you know, some people that attend live, but we actually have about 3,000 active listeners uh, who who um, listen asynchronously to this this podcast or, or download the podcast on a regular basis, which is is so cool. Um, really, really impressed with the work that Anna has done and the whole team has done around creating this incredible podcast. And Daphne, you're taking over and, and you're going to take this into the the next phase of, of growth and excitement and uh, and all the things that are that are going to happen in 2023. So I would love to have you uh, introduce yourself with that with that uh, preamble of, uh, yes. of you know, kind of where we're where we're at today. Well, thank you for passing the baton, and I really hope that I can um, you know continue the excellent hosting that you have done, Jerry. Jerry, excuse me. And I have to say, you know, I've been listening to these podcasts for quite some time. And I'll give you a quick background, you know, about who I am. Um, But, you know, just hearing what Dima and yourself and you have been talking about, you know, it's almost needless to say that I'm just so excited to join a team of talented and smart visionaries, because as you was just talking, you know, he really, and Dima, you guys, the company espouses and really like, walks the walk of a digital mindset, which is key to digital transformation. You know, it's taking calculated risks. It's taking, making data driven, data driven decisions. There's so much to being a digital company. And, you know, um, about me, I have 22 years of global B2B experience. I started at HP Hewlett Packard um, with the first iteration of the B2B e-commerce web store. So I'm really dating myself. Um, And, you know, we really started as a startup, really operating inside this giant company, building what ultimately would be responsible for a platform that was transacting $6 billion in revenue at its peak during my tenure. And from there, I went to an agency helping to develop and lead B2B and digital transformation projects and programs for enterprise customers. And, you know, really, no matter what I do, no matter where I am, my focus always is the customer and the customer has to be at the center of everything I do mm-hmm. or the company does wherever I'm at. So that right there is the big reason of why I decided to join RO. So, yeah, I mean, I think everything people have talked about today, is just, you know, there's lip service and then there's the real talk and the real walk and RO is that the latter. Awesome. Well, well, thank you. Inspiring introduction. Uh, you know, Daphne, when I was, um, you, you and I were getting to know each other th- sort of through this process, it was, it was amazing to me how much experience you have on the customer side of, of you know, B2B commerce and actually growing B2B commerce uh, for, for 20 years is, is, is a lifetime. You were sort of the pioneer in the industry. So, uh, you know, you were doing it before, before anyone, before everybody, you know, while everyone else was talking about it, you were doing it. And so 
I think there, you're just going to add such a richness and depth of perspective that, and, and it's going to be unique from, I think, um, you know, any, anything that anybody else has brought to, to this podcast. So I'm really excited to see where you take it. And with that, I, I'm just going to make you host, uh, Daphne. I'm going to, I'm going to just, I'm going to like, I, why wait until 2023? It's your podcast. J- jump in. Easy. Yeah, and who said B2B moves slowly, right? Yeah, let's do it. <laughs> you know? um, so I do just want to say a quick thing um, just about like what, um, why also I really joined RO and what my mission was, um, just so I can kind of give more context because I really am a long-term practitioner and I've really had to work in this space and, um, you know, at a time when B2B was such an afterthought. I mean, even our team was so small at HP. Um and really kind of proving ourselves. And what I want to just um, talk about is why I really joined Oro. I mean, I pursued this company. Like I have been tracking this company since 2018. And the reason for that is, you know, when you're in the on the business side, and I was, you know, a senior product owner at HP and really having to depend on our IT team and having this enterprise software where, you know, it would take so long to just get any changes. If you had a user defined field, if you had some sort of payment change, any configuration, I was hamstrung and totally dependent on IT. And what I see here in Aura and what is such a game changer about this platform is, you know, you can configure so much in that admin console. And Oro comes along as this native B2B solution and it's a business user's dream, right? So this admin console is giving power to the business and it really enables people like myself as practitioners to not only be responsive to our customers' needs, um, but we are definitely flexible also for all the different verticals that we operate in. And finally, a part of all of that is enabling the company that is using you know, Oro Commerce to be resilient in business operations, which is absolutely key today in this economy. And when you throw in some sales, um, you know, very powerful sales enablement tools, um, that really makes, you know, the merchants and their sales teams much more efficient. So, you know, I guess I could sit here and go on and on and, you know, keep standing on my soapbox. But all in all, I really want to talk about how um, the power of Oro is really um, key in today's economy and in today's world of true digital transformation. So, you know, when every second counts and every penny counts, it's absolutely critical to empower the business to make data-driven decisions so that they can delight their customers in real time. And I've never seen that before in any platform. I mean, let alone, you know, B2B. I've just, I've just never seen that in a platform. So I really want to talk about, you know, the company also overall is, um, is very special. And I would like to turn it over to, instead of me just talking, obviously it's not the Daphna podcast, um, Daphna Uncut, but it's really, I'd like to turn it over to Dima and Yoav to talk a little bit about, um, you know, how special this company is and how they've managed to focus on the people as well. And that was something so different when I joined this company, this team, I saw how, you know, the through crises, this company gets stronger. So for example, with the war in Ukraine, we have so many employees Um, there that, you know, the company took it upon themselves and was being transformative in supporting the team members, keeping the lights on, getting them to safety, doing everything they could. And I'd like to turn to Dima and Yoav and, you know, how, how is it's in your DNA to be very compassionate for our employees, our customers and everything. And I'm curious how you develop that. Um, So thank you, Daphna. And first of all, um, I would also like to throw Jerry in the mix. Jerry is one of our original founders. So Jerry, not a, now will surprise you, and not only that you were uh, moderating and uh, interviewing us. Now you're going to be uh, asked questions as well. So that's our yeah, surprise. I get to, I get to be a, gift to I, you. I get. Yeah, I get, get to be a panelist now. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So <laughs> surprise, here you go. Uh, all that's right, I'm in for, for the all this year that you've put me through this. But um, okay. <laughs> uh, I, I, I made a I made a profession of putting you on the spot, Yoav. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I'll, I'll start with this and uh, Daphna, I think, um, you know, for us, it's not even, uh, we, we, did, we don't realize we do that until we have new people join us and tell us that we focus on, on our uh, company and uh, on our employees and our team, as we call them. 
um, because that's that's how I think a successful company operates, right? I mean, it's uh, we if we would not address and take care of our employees wherever they are around the world, uh, when crisis happens, um, we wouldn't have a company um, because if we fail them, we can't count on them to be there for us uh, later. And again, I don't think we kind of think that necessarily. I think that's just the nature of of how we operate. Um, we we spend hours on top of hours working with these people uh, that we call our family or team. And, you know, when they need us, we're there for them. That's how we were raised. That's how we we operate. And that's what we hope that we will get from other people when they, uh, when we need some help, right? So just taking this not only um, in a business context, these are people that we, uh, we care about. And as a company, that's how we prioritize. We prioritize, and we always say this uh, internally, but, uh, you know, it, it's our customers come first, but right there in that number one position is our employees, because that's the two things that make us successful is our customers and our employees. And without uh, one of them, there's no company, right? So um, thank you for noticing it. Again, like I said, we, we don't think about it on the day to day. We just really do what needs to be done to take care of uh, our customers and our employees, because that's who we are. And that's uh, what we have to, to do as you know, I think it's like parents, right? If you're if you're a parent, you don't think about taking care of your kids, right? It's just a given. So, it's so interesting that Yoav talks about this idea of family, and I make I'm going to go off script because I I just this Yoav's comments triggered this for me. But I I read this whole LinkedIn post, and it was like, you know, the whole post was like, look, your work isn't your family. You don't spend holidays with your work people. You don't like, you, you know, like your your work people are your work people and your family is your family. And and I actually, I was like, well, um, I spent a lot of holidays with, uh, with <laughs> Oro people. Uh, and, and actually like, you know, Yoav and I and, and part of the Oro team celebrated his birthday, uh, you know, a few months ago, we were all together and it was, it was family and, and I, I actually my twenty fifth, right? Like, <laughs> it was actually your thirtieth, Yoav. We can't lie. It was your okay. <laughs> but but we all got together, and and it really, you know, Yoav talks about this idea that you spend every day with these people, uh, you develop these bonds and these relationships, and th- that's the really special thing about Oro is just there's there's um, there's just a personal care, and that that definitely comes from. Uh, from Dima and Yoav, I remember there were so many times in, in our early days, it was stressful. We were going month to month. We were trying to build the business. And I remember it, everything was so fast paced. And I, I still remember, you know, I would type in, and I don't even know, we didn't use Slack back then. It was like Skype or something. You know, I, w- I would type in, in Skype or something to Dima and Yoav and I just have a question uh, like, hey, what's, you know, what do we, what's this for this customer? And, you know, Yoav's, uh, always Yoav's response and Dima's response back to me in the early days was, oh, hey, how are you doing? Uh, how was your weekend? Uh, I was like, oh, God, I need to like slow down a little bit and actually be a human. But that, I mean, that's just how the DNA of the company comes down from the top. There's a lot of, a lot of care. That was something I really learned within, within Oro because my you know, I was the, I was the sales leader. I was like the fast paced transactional guy. And, you know, I, I think I learned a lot from both and I'll let Dima talk after this, but I learned so much from Dima and, and Yoav uh, about how to be caring leaders and how to really care for people beyond, uh, you know, beyond uh, the work day so that when, you know, Thanksgiving comes or new year's or whatever it is, you, you actually, you actually want to spend time together. I mean, I've I've done a lot of holidays in a lot of different uh, in a lot of different locations with a lot of different Oro people, and it's it's one of the things about my life that I treasure the most because you know, look, like the companies come and go, but the relationships and the people is is really what what matters the most. And I'll I'll let Dima uh, jump in on that. Yeah, sure. And I think it, you guys hit the exact point, right? So it's uh, not a team, it's family. And uh, that's how we're approaching it. And uh, I mean, if you look uh, how much time you're spending with your family at Oro and your family at home. So <laughs> I think that <laughs> it's not even comparable. So uh, it's our life and uh, without team, uh, company cannot survive. So the only way to establish uh, 
good team is to build a uh, transparent and uh, friendship-based relationship. And that's what we're trying to do. Excellent. Thank you guys for those um, very honest responses. And I can say, you know, um, I'll just go also off the cuff here. You know, my second week at Oro, you know, I was at a, um, you know, we had a executive onsite where we're talking about 2023 goals. You know, it's my second week and here I am, the newcomer and everybody listened to me. And I, when I spoke, you know, there was no, people, I was, people were paying attention. Nobody was sitting on their laptops. I mean, I've never experienced that before ever in a company where everybody truly cares about what everyone else is saying and is respectful and really wants to make, and it wasn't anything, it wasn't, it was absolutely from the heart. And it was truly like, you're here, you're part of the team, you're part of the family. And, you know, let's hear what we, you got to say. So I just wanted to also add that. And thank you guys. Um, and Jari too, for being a part of that, you know, growth, because you obviously instilled, um, you know, that sort of mindset and that, that sort of. And, and Daphne, I'm reminding you, I'm reminding you that when we were screaming, we were not fighting, we were arguing. Okay, I'm that's just right. <laughs> oh, that's, that still happens. That still happens. It still happens. It still happens. But like, oh, I, I, I remember, I remember one in one of those meetings, I think Jack came out, uh, my son, I have a now 18 year old son at the time, he was like 14 and 15. And, and he, he, he came out to LA and we were doing a meetings in the office and, and, uh, and we were in the conference room and we were debating something. And it's always passionate when we debate something because everybody cares. Everybody has an opinion. Everything feels consequential. And I remember Jack at the end of the day, he was like, man, was everything okay? Were you guys mad at each other? It was like, no, that's just like, it, it's, uh, <laughs> everybody just cares about making it successful. And we're all really passionate. And sometimes we disagree and that's super healthy. Uh, so like that being even modeled as, you know, lowering the risk of conflict was something I also really, really learned at, at Oro because that's how you progress. That's how you see eye to eye. That's how you align and commit on stuff. You know, you, you've got the, the conflict is actually where the goodness happens. It's a healthy tension. Absolutely, Jari. And it's like, you know, that's actually leads to another question I have is you guys are all such visionaries and everybody at the company is, and people all have a platform in which to speak and, you know, give their opinions and, you know, ideas for the future and everyone works together. Can you speak a little bit about, you know, you had created this amazingly successful B2C platform and, you know, then you start to, obviously you have, you spoke earlier and Dima, you talked about um, how, you know, where you saw that B2B, there's a need for B2B, but, kind of keeping this vein of like family and the way you interact, how do you sort of um, see the role of, you know, your peers, your co everyone? I mean, there's so much vision happening at this company that it's so unique. Do you think that's part of the fact that you trust each other and you have these healthy relationships to sort of riff and sort of build upon and yeah, keep go ahead. And I'd really like to hear how that, that mind process works. Yeah. I think, um, you know, when somebody has an idea here at Oro, uh, first of all, we have a platform where anybody can voice anything they want. And and it doesn't mean we all accept it, but um, we do look for a kind of a consensus. So we, we go, the, you know, the way we kind of evolve is anybody can talk, anybody can bring up an idea that they have, and then we kind of start working on it and then processing it. And maybe we don't even make a decision uh, necessarily, uh, unlike startups that have to make decisions so fast and move so fast. Some, some decisions we actually can... Uh, take longer to to kind of make everybody kind of aligned. And and I, I like to use the term, like we agree to disagree and continue, right? So even we hear everybody, we listen to everybody, but once we kind of uh, agree to continue with one path, we all kind of fall in line and we all move as one. And I think that's something that we, we kind of have from, again, 15, 20, some of us, uh, 20 years of working together, right? So it's uh, something that we brought with us. It's... Um, it's okay to disagree and it's okay to hear other people's opinion, but that's how we evolve, right? Because everybody's exposed in their, uh, in their kind of uh, side of the business to different uh, customers, to different, uh, if it's uh, like Dima's talking to developers, we're talking on the business side, we're talking more to customers. But when we bring it all together, it kind of makes a whole picture of what we're building, right? So we're not just uh, listening to one side of the business uh, through one person. We really bring all the opinions together. Everybody can voice them. We actually challenge our employees to voice concerns and things that they think is wrong um, because that's what we want to listen to, right? We say it all the time, both from our customers and our employees. 
tell us what we're doing wrong, not what we're doing right. What we're doing right doesn't matter at this point, right? What we're doing wrong is what we need to kind of improve and change. And once we build this kind of culture, that's what kind of evolves the company and moves us forward because we keep fixing what we're doing wrong. We're learning from um, from the people at the trenches what they need, right? And and it's, you know, just sitting on our high chairs and thinking, oh, our vision is the one we're going to end up with. That's wrong, right? We need to learn to to change. And and as uh, new uh, information comes uh, to us or feedback that we're getting from the ground. We need to apply it and use it to everything we kind of uh, we learned and and change our vision. And like I said, I think you you said it best, uh, Daphna. Is like we have to check our egos out, you know, at the door, right? We we can't bring them into the. It's not about our ego or our vision or my vision or Dima's vision or Jari's vision. It is about a company vision, and it's about moving forward and adapting and adopting this vision to what's going on in the market right now. Absolutely. And I think another important factor is like to uh, let everybody to do what they like to do, right? So mm. people doing what they like to do, their result will be uh, like totally different from what they're doing if you force them to do that. And that is also part of our culture. So we always talk to people, uh, we ask them what they want to do, what they like to do, and we finding them a the right place in the company. Yeah, I think it's interesting because, you know, Google talks about this concept of psychological safety, which is really just this concept that like people feel very low risk in it. They feel very safe to express concerns, to express to express issues, to express things that they want to improve. And, and I've never seen a place that has higher psychological safety really than, than Oro because there, there is just this comfort to say, Hey, <clears throat> I'm not comfortable in any anywhere from anywhere within the organization. You know, anybody can uh, call Yoav, call Dima, uh, and say, "Hey, look, like I'm not comfortable with this, or I'm concerned about this, or you know, I'm I'm this feature has some issues that I really think we need to work through." And that you'll always find the safety to say, "Hey, look, like I'm glad you brought this up. Let's talk through it. Let's make it work." There's a there's a lot of like safety and comfort in the debate. So um, and then like you all have talked about, there's this idea that you know, look, you can disagree and still commit, um, but you, but you do that feeling heard and feeling valued and feeling like just because you have an opinion that's different than the CEO doesn't mean that you know your job's on the line. You know, you can you can still uh, you can still have a a, a strong opinion um, and and move forward with something that that. Um, you know, like just as an example, it's just it's one of those things that's been in the DNA of Oro since the very beginning. And everyone we've hired, we hired really smart, interesting, successful, brilliant people. And and uh, so we want to hear what they have to say. We want to have our minds changed of like, uh, you know, what different direction should we, we go? We, we hired them for that. Uh, was always the perspective, uh, like you yeah, all said. Like, go ahead. No, no, sorry, it was, it was a bit. No, no, I, like you all, I was saying, like you all was saying, we weren't just sitting up like in the in the boardroom, uh, you know, sort of thinking that we were the drinking our own Kool Aid or our own champagne. It was like really, what can we learn from the team, from our customers? Uh, you know, how do we start every day from a from a growth and learning mindset? Yeah, and I think. I think uh, we always have the warning to new employees here <clears throat> that uh, don't don't challenge the CEO unless you are willing to become the new CEO, right? <laughs> so, uh, so I think it's uh, it's uh, something we're actually we actually saying in truth. I mean, all of our careers, I think, um, e even in our previous companies and whatnot, we didn't start where we ended, and that's something I think is um, like we started. Like I started as a developer and ended up as the co-founder and CTO in the company. Yeah, Dima started as one of my developers and ended up as the chief architect and our CTO and co-founder here. So again, I think that's what we like. We actually like to see how people grow, and I think the more criticism, the more they challenge us, the more they're actually advancing the company. If you look back at our history, it's not the other way around, right? And once we kind of, once people join us and see, you know, this person started the disposition, but now he's like a manager, now he's like a, a different role or whatever. This actually kind of, you know, now that I'm thinking and processing, this is something that made us very successful because we allow people to grow 
by not making them afraid to voice their opinions. On the contrary, the more you voice and the more you challenge us, the more we see that you understand. And, and as long as the ideas are kind of in the right direction and aligned with the company, you're just going to become more uh, of an asset to the company. And that's what we love. Uh, we love people to come here and start kind of figuring it out and, and learning and then starting to uh, criticize or, or put points that we need to improve. Um, as long as it's constructive, as long as they're willing to change. Like we say, it's like, if you see something wrong, don't just point that out come up with a solution as well, right? That's what we try and encourage the, the people in our company and people that are good in these environments just grow with us. And I think everybody in our in our kind of uh, team and has, has shown that uh, they don't have to end up where they started. And I think that's what we like about it. I think, and thank you for that. And to, uh, adding to your comment about not being afraid, you know, a lot of people may be listening to this thinking, well, why are, you know, how does this relate to my business? Why, you know, how does this relate to purchasing oral commerce or the oral platform or what have you, you know, the CRM? It relates so much, I believe, and truly from my experience as a practitioner that, you know, we operate in a very fearless environment with seeing challenges as opportunities. As you just spoke, all three of you just spoke about how important it is to be able to be heard. And I think that is an incredible, like that's in our DNA and that's a model for removing fear of transformation in our customers, right? And so you see it in the product, you see it in actual technology, you see it in the way our support team helps our customers and our professional services or how we consult and how as a customer and partner success, you know, I'm trying to help our customers adopt and transform their companies and give them strategies. So as we're wrapping up here, just want to give a couple minutes, you know, to ask you guys about looking to the future and seeing, you know, what is kind of the next big thing in our industry? What do you kind of see as visionaries, you know, with this lens of just open mind, open eyes, open heart, you know, where are you seeing us going, you know, as a company and also in the industry? So uh, as a company, I'll start and um, I do want to let uh, Dima and Jari talk about this, but as a company, our, our, our vision is to uh, become the leading um even though we are probably by the analysts, but really kind of leading the market, uh, not only as the number one platform, but also as the visionaries for what B2B uh, actually has to move into. And, and we're starting to get into that. We're starting to see that we're kind of talking about things that people are not even thinking that needs to be changed. If it's uh, payments or, or uh, customer onboarding or uh, user experience, uh, both for your sales team and for your uh, customers, we really want to be on the forefront of that. We want to continue kind of leading the pack and, and challenging the industry. I know it's not an industry that likes necessarily to be challenged, but are we starting to see changes there? We're starting to see that it's a lot of times a do or die for them, and we want to help them stay in business. We want them to be able to shift to the new kind of uh, culture and new kind of uh, reality, which is technology in the world, right? We can't ignore technology anymore. So we really want to be there on the forefront of that. And I think... Um, for our customers, I think like we said, it's a, it's like a, they have to make a decision, but we also want them to start uh, thinking for themselves and being creative about what they need. I think that's like something that we're trying to work with a lot of our customers. Like I said, we have uh, strategy meetings with our customers. We're trying to kind of tell them what technology can do and kind of have them add, uh, have them tell us what they need in order to be successful or continue being successful in their industry. And then we present them how technology can help them. So. I think we're almost there, right? I think we're we're really on this, uh, you know, tipping point of uh, technology and B two B kind of marrying together and really going to the next step. And uh, that's something that um, I think makes me excited. And I think a lot of our customers we see that they're mentally uh, changing and really um, uh, kind of, uh, you know, just uh, getting technology into their business and making sure that it works for them. Yeah, and as we can see, everything is changing, right? So, like, again, uh, tomorrow could be another change, and, like, everybody should adjust. And uh, uh, But I think a big part of our vision, so we don't want to be just a vendor, right? So we would like to be a partner to our customers and uh, keep our relationship on the level that everybody stays happy. And uh, what more important, that services and product that we provide to our customers delivers uh, big value for them. Excellent. Yeah, I think I, I think for me, the thing that I've been seeing in B2B e-commerce is there's, there's in B2B generally, is there is a new sort of set of disruptors that is poised to 
to come out of the next five to 10 years. Like if you look at B2B generally, there's been so much of a toehold between distributors, wholesalers, their manufacturer relationships out to um, like commercial and, and their distribution sort of like networks. And there's been like a lot of these like embedded toeholds. And I think it, in terms of like how customer relationships are changing and shifting, B2B e-commerce, digital transformation, this kind of work that's happening is going to create a whole new set of disruptors within the B2B world. And it's exciting because I think you see these companies of steel manufacturer in in Utah uh, has the opportunity to be the next big company to take massive market share, to go from 0.001% market share up to three, five, 10% market share because they're creating a better customer experience and they're taking customers from, from uh, you know, their competitors. So I, I think, you know, you all have talked about this idea of, of fueling growth in B2B companies and distributors, manufacturers, wholesalers, and that growth gets fueled by this disruption that's happening through this digital transformation and a better customer experience. And it's really cool to see. I think the next five to 10 years are going to be really exciting. It's a, it's a whole new world out there and it's going to continue to be really interesting to see how the landscape uh, gets shaped up as, as companies create better customer experience and start to take market share from competition. Right. And I think that that absolutely, um, all three of you, everyone's input is spot on. And I think one thing that is very, um, very important to mention here is, you know, in digital transformation and, you know, uh, making sure that it's not only something that you kind of espouse to customers, say like you're a B2B company and you want to kind of transform your their customers work, but it's also the internal transformation. And like I've mentioned before here is that empowering the business users is huge. Removing that hierarchy or like any sort of bureaucratic sort of stepping stones, things that make you more flexible and agile to respond to your customer needs is really what's going to disrupt the marketplace. And the only platform, again, with over 20 years of experience in this space, I can tell you, I've never seen a platform like Oro Commerce and the whole suite with the CRM and empowering your sales. That really is going to be the game changer. And I think that when that's part of a sort of a focal part of a digital transformation in initiative for any enterprise, um, really the sky's the limit because you're optimizing your internal processes, you're empowering your people, you're delighting your customers. Really, it's touching on every point of transformation in order to make you know, our customers successful. So I know we're wrapping up here and we're a couple minutes over time. Um, any last thoughts? And uh, Jari, I want to just thank you again for doing such an amazing job, um, not only in your work in, at Oro, but also just as the leader of this podcast. Um, not sure if I can fill your shoes. I'm going to try. You're going to be great. You're going to be amazing. You'll be better than, <laughs> lots, lots better than me. So I'm excited okay. to see you you take over. And uh, thank, thank you. Thanks for having me today. Okay. So I... Yeah.